Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jim Fleming, and this is a program to mark the eighth anniversary of NBC TV News Film. Now, just to project the top stories of the past eight years would take half a year itself. I dare say you and I have other plans from now till April. So our purpose for the next hour is to seek out those stories which more than any other have set a course for the future. This is a B-29 taking off from a Pacific island on a mission to Hiroshima in Japan early in August 1945. The cargo is an atomic bomb. They will assemble it after takeoff. It is one of two such bombs in existence at this date. We are now loaded. The bomb is alive. We start to climb to our final altitude at 740. It won't be long now. The voice is that of the co-pilot, Bob Lewis, who kept a log of this historic mission. We have now set the automatic pilot for the last time until bombs away. The weapon aboard this plane has the power of 20,000 tons of TNT. Hiroshima is a city of about 350,000 persons. Hiroshima, our primary target is clear. We are now ready for the final bomb run. It is 8.50, not long now. The man who had to make this decision was the President of the United States. The new age of atomic energy presses upon us. Mark that well. What may have been sufficient yesterday is not sufficient today. Civilization cannot survive an atomic war. Nothing would be left but a world reduced to rubble. Gone would be man's hopes for decency. Gone would be our hope for the greatest age in the history of mankind. That was the last message from President Roosevelt. In a speech which he wrote just before he died, but which he never delivered, he said, we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples of all kinds to live and work together in the same world at peace. It is the defense of tolerance and of understanding, of intelligence and thoughtfulness. When we have learned these things, we shall be able to prove that Hiroshima was not the end of civilization, but the beginning of a new and better world. We can and we must make the atomic age an age of peace for the glory of God and the welfare of mankind. Japan surrendered, and the greatest war in the history of mankind ended in victory for the United States and her allies. I think I know the American soldier and sailor. He does not want gratitude or sympathy. He had a job to do. He did not like it, but he did it. And how he did it. Now he wants to come back home and start again the life he loves. A life of peace and quiet. The life of the civilian. The thoughts and hopes of all America, indeed of all the civilized world, are centered tonight on the battleship Missouri. There on that small piece of American soil, anchored in Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. The terms and conditions 
upon which surrender of the Japanese imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. As Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, I announce it my firm purpose in the tradition of the countries I represent to proceed in the discharge of my responsibilities with justice and tolerance while taking all necessary dispositions to ensure that the terms of surrender are fully, promptly, and faithfully complied with. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. night of total victory, we salute you of the armed forces of the United States, wherever you may be. What a job you have done. We are all waiting for the day when you will be home with us again. Good luck and God bless you. again. Right away if you have the points. Over 12 million Americans served in the armed forces in World War II. Home again. Home again and quite often a wife and family following after. War brides from overseas. C'est la guerre. Home again, not quite what we had in mind, but once we get that GI loan, then watch us go. Bedroom here, living room there, and no fireplace, uh, we'll put that in later. Everything automatic, except the mortgage. The family men of this new atomic age had had their war, they wanted to settle down, they did. The large families of Grandfather's Day became fashionable again. And this new generation in one year numbered half again as many babies as turned up in 1940, and that was a pretty good year by pre-war standards. These were the most remarkable children in the history of the United States, according to their parents. Stronger, healthier, more intelligent, well, you can see for yourself. Something for NBC. Splendid. 1945, a time of hope and optimism. Now surely the statesmen would work to keep the peace. In the gallery of world capitals, the idea of the brotherhood of man was expressed in charters and proclamations. Even, yes, even in music. Maestro Arturo Toscanini went back to the 19th century to revive Giuseppe Verdi's Hymn of Peace with its idea of a world united in true peace.
idealism expressed by Verdi in the 19th century and many men of goodwill in the 20th was not always reflected in the reality that was the United Nations. Tomorrow, November 29th or, or December 1st, if you wish, whatever it is, and settle the question of prisoners of war on January 1st. Why not? Why not? Really, why not? I just don't understand. No real arguments have been set forth here. Uh, we have been charged, we've been accused of coming here and dictating or inflicting things upon us. We don't dictate anything. We modestly set forth our suggestions, trying, doing our best to be logical. We all hear a good deal of unhappy murmuring about the United Nations. It is easy to understand this dismay. None of us is above irritation and frustration over the seemingly vain and tedious processes of political discourse, particularly in times of great crisis. But none of us can rightly forget that neither the world nor the United Nations is or can be made in a single image of one nation's will or ideas. One of the greatest values of the United Nations is this. It holds up a mirror in which the world can see its true self. And what should we want to see in such a mirror but the whole truth at such a time of total struggle? The words of President Eisenhower on the UN in the sixth month of his administration. If the forces for world unity often seem feeble, the forces of nationalism in this time were strong, insistent. This was a time of new governments, new nations. We're watching Count Foca Bernadotte. He lost his life in the birth of the nation that's Israel. The new nations made a long list. The list of these newborn and reborn nations is astounding. Israel, India, and Pakistan. Burma, Ceylon, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Indonesia, Libya, Abyssinia, and the Philippines. In total, these lands embrace some 560 million people, inhabiting millions of square miles across three continents. To the fearful among us, these may seem only dangerous spots for communist attack. Young and vulnerable nations, at once susceptible to intrigue and defenseless uh, to attack. But to those of us of stouter faith, these are not so much areas of danger as areas of hope. These new lands challenge us to prove again that the faith we hold is never weary and is ever new. As the surging force of nationalism was felt overseas, we felt a new force right here at home in our living rooms, the force of television. Uh, back about eight years ago, there were 10,000 receivers in this country. Today, there are 24 million and a half. TV has been shot at, applauded, argued about, analyzed by everyone from Haile Selassie to Sir Winston Churchill. 